Please sing with me hymn number 2031, our call to worship. Gracious God, thank you for the privilege of lifting our voices to you in prayer. You know what is in our hearts before we pray, but to understand that you hear the cries of our heart and the needs of our minds is to know your presence now, even to the end of the age. Amen. Remain standing and sing hymn number 496, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
This morning we celebrate many joys. We celebrate the joy of, of living and, and breathing because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We celebrate the joy of, of, of faith. We celebrate the joy of family, of friends, of, of coming to this house in prayer and, and just celebrating. Uh, that name, that word keeps coming to my, my, my mind to celebrate the Lord in all we can. We also uh, celebrate Martin Luther King uh, this weekend, and I, I think about Dr. King, and to me, he was a modern-day prophet, uh, one who brought the word with an awful lot of power. And, and one of the things he said that, that, that struck me was that the church needs to be the thermostat and not a thermometer. A thermometer is something that that gauges the temperature of something. The church is no gauge. The church is a thermostat, and we set the temperature. And so as we, we come to this time, and, and we'll be talking about the means of grace quite a bit here over the next few weeks, we'll be talking about prayer here this morning. We talk about the church and our prayers uh, being the thermostat of our lives, our nation, and our world. And so that... I just wanted to bring that up. The, the one joy I want to bring also is uh, we're starting the Bible study next Sunday. And take your coffee, take your donuts, go down the hall. Uh, there's a wonderful study called uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which is going to be led by, by Kim Russell. It, it's, a, it's a fabulous book. It's a fabulous book. Just take a few weeks. And if you, even if you don't go, Please get the book, but I encourage you to, to study it. To, it, will, it will change your life. It will change how you think about your faith and about your spirit. Um, a lot of good things happening. A lot of things we need to pray for. Uh, please uh, pray for our nation as we undergo quite a bit of change here in, in this upcoming week. Uh, prayers for vision. Prayers for, prayers for wisdom. Prayers for compassion. Uh, also, if you would look at our prayer list, we have a couple I'd like to um, add to this list. If you would please pray for Greg Sutton. Also, the family and friends of Virginia Packer. That is Adrian Woods' mother, who passed away this past week. Um, also, um, the family and friends of Angelo. And also, uh, Luisa and Matilda Quintata were involved in a serious accident, so please pray for for swift healing for them as well. Are there any more concerns or joys of the church here this morning? Um, prayers for Kirsten's um, healing from wisdom teeth surgery and that she's healthy enough to fly back on um, Wednesday and just travel blessings for in-laws who are in town to see her and her back to Prayers for Kirsten, recovery from wisdom teeth extraction, and safe travels back home. Are there others? Yes, Anna. Joy of safe return. Enjoy everything's all right. You also share with me there's a Methodist church starting in your hometown. What's the name of the church? United it's just the United Methodist Church. <laughs> only 50 members. <laughs> just starting with only 50 members. <laughs> well, 50 members is pretty good. We'll keep that one in prayer. Anyone else? Let us go to God then in silent prayer.
Gracious God, as we gather in your house of prayer this morning, we realize something, that we need you. Every hour, we need you. Lord God, our prayers are our communion with you, our lifeline that you extend to us. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing our prayers, for answering our prayers, for soothing our spirit and our soul. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for forgiving us of sometimes turning away. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, and your power. We gather here today. We come here with an awful lot of joy awful lot of celebration in you, Lord God, and we lift that joy up to you this day. We thank you, Lord, for our family, our friends, and we thank you for this church, Lord. We thank you for all the lives that have changed as a result of the ministries you have called us uh, uh, to do here in our community, in our nation, in our world. Lord God, we, we gather here this day knowing that as in the upcoming week there will be many changes in our nation, we do pray that our new leaders will lead with compassion, will lead with wisdom, will lead with discernment, will lead with the joy of believing that you are in power and in charge. Uh, Lord God, we, we pray for our whole world, we pray for our community, our community leaders, first responders. We pray for those that, that work tirelessly uh, for the, in the ministry for others. Lord God, we pray for those that, that cannot be here this day, those who are traveling, travel blessings upon them, uh, those who are sick, those who are homebound, hospitalized, those that are recovering from surgeries and those who are anticipating surgeries in the upcoming week. Uh, we pray your watch care upon each and every one of them. Lord God, we do lift up those who mourn the loss of loved ones this day. Especially, we, we lift up to you the family and friends of Ruth Price, the family and friends of Virginia Yeager, the family and friends of Dennis Belter, the family and friends of Virginia Packer, and the family and friends of Angelo. Lord God, in the midst of their grief and, and loss, may there be hope and certainty of everlasting life the ones they have lost. Lord God, we, we pray for all the caregivers that, that care for their loved ones seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, we pray for them uh, to have wisdom, strength, hope, uh, peace, and comfort in, in all of the, of the love that they share with their loved ones. Lord God, we lift up to you Penny and Nina and Dave, for Spencer, for Zach and Sam, for Dave and Tom, for Kim and Cal and Bill, for Judy, for Tony and Gordon and Sarah, for Luis and Matilda, for Katie and family, for Tom, for Lori, for Brian, for the Dolan family, for Larry and Linda, for Greg, and for Kirsten, and for all those others, Lord God, we've lifted up to you either by voice or deep within our souls. Lord God, we pray your Holy Spirit rest upon each and every one that they may be enlivened by your Holy Spirit that, that you reach and heal their bodies and nourish their wonderful faith, Lord God. Sent them forth rejoicing, knowing that you are with them now, even to the end of the age. And now, Lord God, we pray for each other and for ourselves that we may be enlivened by your Holy Spirit to continue the good work that you have begun in each and every one of us. These things we pray through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray boldly together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's first scripture reading, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6, can be found in the Bible 1174. I urge, then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Amen. And now for the tithes and offerings. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you, for using the gifts you have given us to make incredible transformations in other people's lives. Lord, we pray your anointing upon our lives, your anointing upon these gifts we now lay before you. May they all be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. Let us pray. Lord God, open our hearts and minds by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit that as this scripture is read and proclaimed, that we may be filled with joy, that we may know the transformative spirit uh, that you offer to us this day. Now, Lord God, may your word come through me or in spite of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for yet one more opportunity for us to try to get it right. Amen. Jesus' disciples were conflicted, using a psychological term, because they heard everybody preaching or praying these eloquent prayers with all the right words and all the right things. So they went to Jesus and asked him a pretty simple question. How in the world, Jesus, do we pray? So here's the response according to St. Matthew. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The human soul whether proactively or deep, deep down inside, seeks a closer relationship with God, seeks a coming home of sorts, or some may say a come to Jesus moment. Peter Scavaro, in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, I'll put one more plug in for that, an amazing book, in his book, he writes this, that ultimately, as children of God, we are called to a life with God rather than a life for God. In other words, we long to be in relationship with our Creator, not just to work for God, not just to have this laundry list of things that we need to do, that we think may draw us closer to God. No, our soul longs for more than a laundry list, more of a series of tasks to be done. Our soul longs to be with God. So this morning, we consider what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, would call the means of grace, but another term in terms to use would be, how do we draw ourselves closer to God? How do we form this relationship with God? We form it by grace. And so these things that we do help us to be drawn closer by God and faith or the means of grace. And, and the five that Wesley would contend would help towards that end would be prayer, reading and studying scripture, attending to the ordinances of God, we're doing that this morning in worship, also Holy Communion, fasting, and Christian conversation. These five means of grace, when we, when we have these things in our, in our daily routine, in our daily life, we encounter God. We actually experience who God is. For every moment we need that assurance of God's grace in our life. And we need to have that relationship with God. Scavero in this book would also go on and say that we are not called human doings. I like that. 
We are called human beings. We are called to be with God. So consider prayer this morning as a means of grace, of God's presence. And consider prayer, and, and some of us learn prayer at a very early age. I remember growing up, I can't remember when I was taught this, but it must have been at the pretty early. Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. As I, I still pray that. Almost 60 years later, I still pray that prayer my, my mom taught me. But only recently, that little last phrase. I didn't quite know what I was praying then. But I certainly do now. Or before every meal. God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. Which turned into, God is great, God is, amen. <laughs> but we learn those prayers at a very young age. It becomes a part of our life. You can't sit down, whether at home or in a restaurant, without bowing your head and saying, thank you, Jesus for this provision that you have laid before me. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of this food that strengthens my body so that I may do your work. Teaching children to pray is incredible. Teaching children to pray is an amazing gift that we give to them. I said when I was younger, maybe I didn't fully realize what my folks were teaching me. But I thank Jesus for that gift now because it continues on. And maybe the reason our prayer life becomes more and more profound because we begin to see the absolute need for God in our life, the absolute need for, for, for God in our everyday journey. Maybe because we need to have this, this communion and communication with God. And when we do, our prayers become more real. You know, some have been praying for an awful long time. Some maybe just started the prayer life. Some may be trying to make prayer too complicated. Most are probably in between. Still others believe that prayer is only is appropriate at certain times and in certain places with certain people. And where there is a public place, school, or other activities, maybe prayer is not so important. I will tell you. I'm praying this Thursday morning at the State of the City address here in North Ridgeville. And I think that is quite a, not an only an honor, but a privilege to pray for our community, to pray for our leaders. And guess what, saints? It's in the Board of Education. I like that. Because I don't know whether you know this or not, but our children are allowed to pray in school. It is not against the law for anyone to pray in a school. A teacher can't pray for you, allowed. A child can pray in school. You can pray wherever you want. You know why? Because we need that lifeline wherever we are all the time. It doesn't stop at the door of a government building. It doesn't stop at the door of the church. Even though God, Jesus said this is a house of prayer, well, guess what? The house of prayer is the church, which is called the ecclesia, which means the people of God, and the people of God go beyond these four walls. 
And I'll tell you, our nation needs prayer. Our leaders need prayer. Our world needs prayer. The people of God need prayer because we all need God's grace in our lives. We all need the power and presence that only God can give us. That's what prayer is all about. There's no magical formula for praying. There's nothing you have to do or not do. You don't have to use Victorian English to make it sound sweet. Just read the Psalms and hear the prayers of those who are hurting. Just read Lamentations and you will hear prayers from the heart and from the soul. You see, our prayer is not a laundry list of things for God to do for us. But our prayer is our relationship with God. And through our prayers, we experience God. You want to know, you want to know God? Just like you want to know a friend. If you meet with a friend for the first time, you just sit there and not say anything? How can you keep up that relationship? Talk to God. God wants to hear. Now, I think about Hannah in the, in the sanctuary and her, mouth, and her mouth was moving and the priest said, you know, you're crazy. And Hannah said, no, I'm praying to God. I'm praying to God for strength. I'm praying for God for healing. I'm praying for God for guidance. There's no magic formula to prayer. No specific time or place. No, prayer is meant as a gift from God to be a means of grace. To allow God's grace to emanate in the midst of the people, in the lives of ourselves, in the lives of others. Pray continually. Does not always mean being on your knees, but it means to be in an attitude of prayer all the time. Because as we're in our, in our prayer time, we are in relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is through prayer that we, we find the power, grace, and mercy. My wife, Lori, has gotten me into watching movies over the last several years. I thank God for her every day and for really for getting me out of the house, you know. Um, she goes with me, by the way. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a, a recent movie called Deepwater Horizon. I don't know if you have, has anybody seen that? There is something interesting about that movie. We were watching it, and it had to do with one of the um, uh, oil rigs or platform out in the caught fire. And... And there's all this, all this explosions and all these things, and 11 people lost their lives. I mean, it was a pretty insidious thing off the, off the coast of Louisiana. And what was interesting was towards the end, there was, there was a freighter or something sitting out there. I don't know why. Uh, and as all the lifeboats came in and, and people settled in on the, on the deck of the ship that was out there, Something very interesting happened. They, they looked at the this inferno, and I guess they could see it from satellites. It was that big. You know what those men and one woman did? They got on their knees, and they prayed the Lord's Prayer. I was watching that movie, and there was a still silence in the movie house. What else can you do? 
What else can you do when you have nothing? When, when you have your life that was so close to being lost, what else can you do but pray? They prayed for those families who were lost, I am sure. But prayer... is all about faith, is all about hope, is all about trust. Disciples needed a piece of that. And that's why when, when they asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Because we see the power that has to teach us. How do you pray? Jesus. Jesus essentially said, take yourself out of the center, folk. And start praying with boldness. Our Father in heaven. How will be your name, not mine. Your kingdom's coming, not mine. Your will be done, not mine, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, so we can go out and start forgiving others. And lead us out of temptation because we can't do it ourselves. And deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh, Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray from our heart and from our soul. I sat with a man for several months and we talked about the Psalms a lot. And we saw the, 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 the pain and the anguish. And even in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me but later on in that psalm? But you are my God. You are my rock. You see, our prayers open up our heart and open up our soul to God. Any relationship worth anything means that we open up ourselves to others. And in prayer, we open ourselves up to God. You see, we begin to think differently. That's what it is. A means of grace allows us to think differently about everything. Allows us to think differently about this thing we call faith, this thing we call church, this thing we call God. I was sitting with a group of folk yesterday morning in, in one of the books on March, I believe, 18th or 25th. There's a leadership academy here in North Coast District, and the, the author of a book, Weird Church, is going to be there. And, and we were talking about Weird Church. And then... We started thinking, well, and, and, these, and, and she has some really great ideas. And, when, uh, and, and one of the things is, is you know, we, we don't do church as we've always done it before. And it's kind of weird to meet in a bar or, or, or a coffee shop or something like that or meet out in, in all these different places. But, but we, we decided that really maybe what we're doing is weird church. Maybe what we're doing is we need to, we need to, to accept what God has given to us now. And maybe that might feel a little bit weird. Maybe it might feel a little bit weird that, that we, we say, hey, everything I have is a gift from God. Maybe not for some of us sitting here this morning. But folks got to realize that, that everything we have is a gift from God, and that might feel a little bit weird, but it's really true. God has given us a great gift. God has given us a gift of prayer. And when we start praying... It might feel a little weird that we don't start looking at things from a human point of view any longer, but we start seeing the spiritual dimension of what our faith is all about. So the key to prayer is nothing more but trust. 
Just trust God. Just trust that God is listening. God is going to answer those prayers. Maybe not according to our laundry list, but God will answer our prayers. And God is our rock and our redeemer. When we pray, we witness our faith. It is a symphony of prayer when the people of God pray. It's a gift to pray for someone else. I'll tell you a story this past summer. Yeah, it was, a, it was one of those interesting... You ever have an interesting day? Yeah. Okay. It was an interesting day. And I come to church, it was a Tuesday. A fellow comes up to me here in the church and says, I want to tell you something. I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for your family. And I was trying to be as stalwart as I could in front of him. But when I turned my back, a tear came to my eye and said, thank you, Jesus, for that person who offered me an incredible witness of faith. At that moment, I needed his prayers. It's a gift to pray for somebody else. It's a gift. I'll tell you a secret that only between you and the people on the web will hear. <laughs> it's all secure, right? I don't really follow the HIPAA rules very well when I go into a hospital. I'm sorry, medical people. Go in to pray for one of our folk here or a friend of yours or whoever you want to pray for. I go into there and I always make sure the person in the bed next to it. Are you doing okay? What's interesting is they usually are praying along with us. They were told, we're, we're told we're not allowed to do that. Rules and me don't get along all the time very well. Because the people of God need prayer. And it's amazing how many people appreciate prayer in their life. Prayer is their lifeline. Prayer is a gift. I remember several years ago, I had one of those mornings and I was trying to figure out something and, and all of a sudden there was, a, there was an email that came from a friend of mine by the name of Tom Ford and he said, Tom, I'm praying for you today. I called him back. I said, thank you for that gift. He said, why? I said, because I was stuck. I was trying to write a sermon or something like that. I was stuck. But because you were praying for me, apparently I got off square one. Which if you want a good sermon, I guess pray for me. But <laughs> Prayers change lives. Prayer transforms our life. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to pray to God. It's a privilege to pray for someone else. Don't worry about the words. Jesus says, I will give you the words. Just extend that gift of prayer to someone in need. Just do it. Amen. Just do it. And you will be a blessing to someone else. Pray with boldness. That means with the confidence of a child of God. God listens. Pray for the church boldly. Tuesday mornings, 11.15, come and pray with us. There's a small group that prays now. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a small group of men who pray before this worship every Sunday morning. Pray. Never miss the opportunity or the privilege of praying for someone else. Because in your prayers, 
You are experiencing God's grace. You are sharing God's grace. And your prayer. At that moment you pray. Could be all the hope. That that person desperately needed. In their life at that moment. Saints pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Let us now stand and, and sing with joy our closing hymn, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. of God, the peace and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all now, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen.